The age of the Earth. How old is it, really? And here to discuss this wonderful question is Dr. Stephen Dill, and w welcome to uh, Prophecy Watchers. Gary, I, I thank you. This has been a real privilege. I, I'm, I'm serious. Well, we're know. honored to have you. And now, I want, I want to say right up front that, uh, that Steve's book is called In the Beginnings. I mean, notice the word beginnings is plural. Uh, deals with the age of the earth as seen in the pages of Scripture. As I started, and I won't go into details, but as I began to study the Bible more and more and more, I began to realize that evolution was not true. From the scientific perspective, science showed it was not true. And that meant I had a problem with my theology. So I began to study what does the Bible say? And there's lots of different opinions, different interpretations, different theories you call them. But what does the Bible really say? And I was a theistic evolutionist, mm -hmm. and then I became a day age creationist, and then I discovered that didn't make biblical Meaning that sense. The days of creation were, we're, we're long ages, we're long of, ages, millions of years or billions of years, and so day one was a you know billion years, day two was two big whatever long periods of time, and and there are people who believe that, and and that that's fine, but as I studied from personally, I realized that, that didn't make sense, so from day age I read more information, I became a young earth creationist. And I believed that for a long time. I used to defend that very strongly. Mm -hmm. In all that time of eight years of college, I was looking for, I'd already become creationist, was there any evidence that could be used to defend evolution? And it was never, never presented. Everything was suppositions. This is my opinion, this is what we think, but they never provided any scientific evidence for evolution. Yeah, and before this program, uh, Steve uh, talked to me at length about how uh, evolutionists really don't have a leg to stand on when it comes to evidence, right? Right, none, none. This is what people believe, this is what science says, but when you actually look for the evidence, and that, that was the experience I had when I was in the Navy, I was in Scotland, I went to the University of Glasgow bookstore, college, university, got a first year biology textbook, purely secular. I read through that looking for the evidence of evolution. Everything was, we think it's this, it's our assumption that. Most experts agree this, but there was never any real hard factual evidence for evolution. And that just, Wow, that was the first time I, I tell people that was the first time I read a book with my eyes open. Now, let's go right to the heart of the matter, and I have my Bible open to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, verse 2, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon uh, the face of the waters, verse 3, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Those three verses, under a lot of discussion, and you've written a book called In the Beginnings. And I've got to tell you folks right up front that this book uh, will take you places <laughs> that you've probably never thought of before. But because uh, Steve has a way, well he's a very analytical mind, but he makes points that are very, very clear. Let's discuss the first three verses in the Bible okay. and what they mean to you. Well, first of all, the title is a kind of play on words. I, not in the beginning, but in the beginning, because I believe the Bible, if you study it in detail, here a little, there a little, don't just stick in Genesis, read what other parts of the Bible say, you'll discover that the Bible talks about the earth having two beginnings. There was a beginning of time, Genesis 1 1, and then there was another beginning, which was a new beginning, a new creation, and that's Genesis 1 3 following. So there were two beginnings. And between those two, there was a period of time that I think, and used to be widely believed, Satan, Lucifer, ruled this earth. 
And he now, thought, you said uh, people used to believe that uh, in this, as uh, when the Earth was without form and void, as a very, very long period. Oh, absolutely, of time. yeah, yeah. It's and and going all the way back into early Judaism, for example, uh, the Jewish idea of creation was really more restoration. Yeah. Uh, whereas the Earth had yeah. suffered a tumultuous downfall. Yeah, it, it's. Uh, if you read the book uh, Without Form and Void by Arthur Cussens, he brings this out. Uh, the Targum of Onkelos, which was the most ancient Aramaic translation of the Old Testament, which is probably written around A.D. 100, 150, mm -hmm. so around the time of Christ, a little bit after. They describe that as not just without form and void. The earth was destroyed. They actually interpret it that way. So mm -hmm. that means there was an earth, something happened, it got destroyed. The six days of Genesis, which were six literal 24-hour days, were six days of restoration. Sin, judgment, death, restoration. Now, where does Satan fit in all this? Uh, you have uh, uh, this magnificent figure. He was called the anointed cherub. Mm -hmm. He was uh, placed in very, very high position, and he fell. And you and I both believe that his fall was catastrophic. Absolutely. Had and universal. And universal. Let's go into that a little bit. Well, I believe, and I, I'm not alone, there are many, many Christian scholars for hundreds of years who believe that Lucifer had a realm, a kingdom that he was in charge of long before Adam existed. Mm -hmm. this, this would have been the pre-Adamic world. Whatever he was doing he wound up, because of his pride and his beauty and his splendor, rebelling against God, bringing in this rebellion death and destruction. It eventually culminated in death and destruction on earth to the point that God had to wipe out all life. Similar to what he did with the time of Noah, but it was a little different. It was before that. And there was nothing alive on the earth in the interim. So there, nothing evolved. Everything was dead. Mm -hmm. So the six days were literally six days of creation, not, not evolution. In six days, God created everything. Grass, trees, insects, whales. And you believe they're, they're literal days. They're literal days, absolutely. Absolutely. The, if you look at the Hebrew, what the word means... And it, it's a big, long study just in that. Yeah, you, you've got a sheet of notes here. In fact, uh, he handed me the notes. He said, I'd like to kind of follow along these notes. And I thought, uh-oh, we can't do this in 30 minutes. No. But, but we, we can go into uh, the basis of well, your belief. Well, the basic, like the word day itself, yom. Now, what does that mean? It means in Hebrew, it does define a 24-hour day. Yeah, that's true. It does define the light portion of a day. Just like the word day, we mm -hmm. talk about day, it could be 24 hours or 12 hours. But it also does define a long, unspecified period of time. But when it's used that way, it's almost always in the plural. In the days of Moses, in the days of Abraham. Because when it's in the singular, using for a period of time, not just in, back in my day, mm -hmm. but used for a passage of time, it's almost always a 24 hour day or a 12 hour light period. So that word by itself doesn't actually demand days. But when you combine it with companion words like day and night, mm -hmm. evening and morning, light and dark, when you look at how those words are used to define periods of time, well, for instance, light might be used for enlightenment and blessing and health and wisdom. But when used for a period of time, it's only used for the light portion of a 24-hour day. And, of course, as everyone knows who's read the Bible, even in a cursory fashion, uh, Genesis chapter 1 lays out uh, a period of six days, six. followed by a, a yeah. day of rest. Yeah. And the word night, you know, is also used in here. And so you believe that th those days and nights were literal days and nights. Yeah, it'd be hard for me to believe they were days of millions of years and then in one night, dark period, and then millions of years of light, <laughs> and 12 hours of dark, and a million yeah. years of light. It doesn't work. It's cyclic. You're talking yeah. about a real day and a real night, a real 24-hour. The Hebrews measured the day 
evening and morning. It doesn't mean from evening until morning. It means the day was made up of an evening and a morning, mm -hmm. 24 hours. That's how they measured time. And that's what Genesis reveals. The evening and the morning were one day. Now the interesting thing about this is that when you talk about these days, uh, you, you you have no room for for evolution None. of any kind. None. If you're talking about six literal days, yeah. and as as a scientist, that was the big thing for me to discover that science proves evolution never happened. It, it it's the most concocted, idiotic. <laughs> well, I, but I have to tell you that globally. In all the, the uh, institutions of learning, from you know grade school on sure. up, this I, is... I was raised that way. This is the religion. I was raised that way. I believe in evolution until... I, mean, I became a Christian. I still believe in evolution. It wasn't until... I was in a, I, when I was in the Navy, I was on a ship in Scotland, and in my shop I had two friends. One was an atheist and the other was an agnostic. And we would argue about, I'd just become a Christian, and we'd argue about things, we'd pull these all-nighters. And this agnostic was really fair. He'd sometimes be on my side, sometimes oppose me. And he knew I believed the Bible, but he also knew I believed in evolution. So my belief of evolution was Adam and Eve were symbolic of men and women. The garden was symbolic of the perfect environment. The soil, the dirt, was symbolic of the elements. And he asked me one night, well, if I believe in evolution, and I believe that Adam was symbolic of man, and Eve was symbolic of women, who came first, man or woman? And I realized the Bible said Adam came first. Now, I wasn't a scientist that, at that time, but I knew, suspected, man, human, males, could not evolve very far without women. And that was the first time in my life that I began to question evolution. Hmm. It was from an agnostic. He made me think. So I went to the University of Glasgow, picked up a book and started reading and never since have I ever believed in evolution. I've discovered that real science proves evolution is false. It never happened. Now, I want to point out something that, that I think is very important in this discussion that we're having with uh, Steve. And that is, he has a goal in writing this book called In the Beginnings. And, and your number one goal, you told me, was to knock down scientific barriers to belief right. in Be the Bible. Because evolution is one of those. And the gap theory, which is what this is about, two beginnings, destroys that. Because everything was dead in that gap. Evolution couldn't have happened. But it also, there are scientific barriers. There are different theories of creation. Mm -hmm. Young Earth, Old Earth, Framework Theory, Divine Decrees, there's all kinds of different theories. Some of those... And there are variations on all those themes. Even gap theory has variations. But there are some variations, some creationists, who make claims that are not just unscientific, but anti-scientific. Hmm. If you believe in science, you're from the devil. And if you don't believe this, then you... And that, when you read something from the Bible that you know contradicts what science teaches, as an unbeliever, you're going to say, well, the Bible is wrong about our origin. How it explains how we got here is wrong. I know that's not true, so I'm not going to read the rest of it. Why even bother? They force them to make a decision, to believe something that's not true, scientifically true, and they won't do it, and, and good for them. But what I want to do is I want to show people that the Bible itself, actually, everything it says about nature is true. Everything science has revealed agrees with what the Bible says. So if I look at a Hubble Space Telescope yeah. picture yeah. and it tells me that there are galaxies out there that are billions of light years away, or if I look at, at uh, planets through mm -hmm. a telescope, or, or if I look at something in nature through a microscope, it's all the same experience. I can believe what I see Absolutely. and it was created by God. Absolutely. And there are some creation theories that have to tell you, you can't believe that is true. It's only apparent. God only made it look that way. Like, for instance, fossils. At one time, one of the beliefs, creation theories, was that there never really was animals or plants that became fossils. They were just strange rock formations mm -hmm. that God created in the soil to make it look like animals lived a long time ago or that plants lived a long time ago. Wow. They, actually, they actually refused to believe fossils could be ancient. They looked at the geological strata. Well, that can't be true. 
God had to just make it look that way. <laughs> well, that's fine. And, it, it, and again, believing ruin restoration theory is not a prerequisite for becoming a Christian. I mean, you, you can, you're saved if you believe whatever theory you want. You put your trust in yeah. Jesus. But for a lot of people, their theories create scientific barriers. And my point is that if you can't believe what the Bible says about our origin, how we got here, the past, how can you convince someone to believe what the Bible says about our future, our destiny, the, what's going to happen next? If God lied here, <laughs> I'm not going to believe what he says here. And that's the purpose for this book, Foundations, showing you that there's nothing in the Bible that disagrees with anything science truly reveals. And the reverse is true too. Everything science reveals agrees with everything the Bible truly reveals. So if when I read sentence one in the Bible, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, uh, what was that beginning? That would have been the beginning of the universe. I don't know how long ago, I suppose, from my scientific background, I would assume that's probably about 14 billion years ago. Not an and, illusion, but an actual thought. No, no, that was, that was an act of creation. Yeah, there are interpretations where like Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2 are a title and a subtitle. Yeah. Not really an act of creation, but that creates some real problems because they don't agree with, with the six days. Genesis 1, 2 ends with the earth being dark and dead. Six days end with light and life. So the title didn't agree with, with the details. So there's a problem with that interpretation. And take my word, once you begin to read the Bible in this way, other uh, aspects of Scripture in the Old Testament, New Testament, will begin to take on a new crispness, a a new reality. Mm -hmm. If you simply believe that the beginning of sentence one, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, was a very, very long time ago. Mm -hmm. Second sentence, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. That verb was, Mm -hmm. has been discussed. In fact, entire books have been written about that word. Uh, And the the earth was without form and void. Let's talk about that. Well, the Hebrew word is, and I'm not a Hebrew, I don't read Hebrew or nowhere near begin to claim to be any expertise in Hebrew, but I've studied it. It's Hayah, H-A-Y-A-H, depending on your pronunciation. And it is similar, but not the same as the English word was or to be, the definitive to be. Hebrews thought differently than we think. And that's okay because different cultures, different languages, they think different ways. In the Hebrew, and you can look this up, they never really thought of the word haya in a static sense. It was always a becoming, like when it's the same word is used for Eve was the mm-hmm. mother of all living. Well, she wasn't the mother of all living. She became the mother of all living. Uh-huh. That's, in their mind, they would think that. It means to dynamically change. So Genesis 1-2, when it says the earth was, it's actually saying, and the earth became with that form of void. In fact, it actually says but instead of and. Meaning? Meaning that there was a time when something happened on the earth, and I'm going to assume it's, it's connected with Lucifer and his fall. Don't know that for sure, but if it's not, the Bible doesn't explain it. Some kind of judgment, death, God wiped out the earth, life on it. It was dead and desolate and dark and flooded, covered by water. Mm-hmm. This was the first flood. And after some period of time, I don't know how long, I think it was probably short, he restored the earth. This was a new creation. A new creator, I mean a new creation was being started. This is parallel to our salvation. Human beings, Adam was created, it's without sin. He sinned, he rebelled, he was judged, he died. All of us are sinners, but God restores us. The idea of a restoration of the earth is a foreshadow of what God was going to do with man. Mm. Man, Adam, you're made from dirt. Did you see what I did to the earth? I restored it. Adam, guess what? I'm going to restore you. And that's why I talk about beginnings, because and we the, have an, the a, a plan of restoration then takes us through the whole Bible. Absolutely. Uh, the, the seed of the woman, uh, the virgin birth of Christ, the, his 
his death, burial, and resurrection, the vicarious substitutionary atonement. All of this is part of the restoration. It's all what God does. It's, it's, it's never what we do. I could not make myself be reborn. I could not restore my soul. No matter how hard I, even if I'd wanted to, no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't make myself righteous. God has to do that. God has to restore me. Well, I think the same thing was true with the earth. The earth being dead could not restore itself. It could not bring light to itself. God had to do that. So it, it's a perfect parallel. If, if, if you were a type and anatype, what God did with the earth was, I think, a, an indicated to tell Lucifer, look what I'm going to do next. I'm going to create a new being, but this one's going to be made in my image. Now, darkness, uh, if you read verse uh, 2, was, was on the face of the deep. In mm-hmm. other words, every, I, I can't imagine the kind of darkness that there must have been. And God then says, let there be light. Right. And so the whole thing is a counterplay between darkness and light. Mm-hmm. In fact, that's true of the entire Bible. Yeah. Uh, we read about Jesus. In Him was light and, and there was no darkness at all. Uh, so the figure of Jesus as the restorer of the broken universe, it, it personalizes something that begins in sentence uh, three of the Bible. And this is this dark period that's been a problem. How can you, if you believe in an old universe, mm-hmm. science says the sun came first, long yeah, before the that's earth. That's true. Okay. So how could the earth be dark if if it was existed before? I mean, it, it, there's no time in Earth's history when the earth was dark. Because the sun was always there. So how could it not be till the day, day four, the fourth day? Mm-hmm. But if you take away the idea, we're talking about physical darkness, that what God did, and he did this two other times, he made the earth go dark. Egypt, three yes. days. Right. It was dark in Egypt, it wasn't dark in Goshen. Now that's not an eclipse. A lot of people look at eclipses like, oh, this is a sign of you know, God or the end time. Eclipses don't last three days. Three minutes. <laughs> yeah, that, that's exactly about it. But yeah. this was dark for three days. Well, the yeah. sun didn't go away. God was able to create. He just, and I don't know how he did this. I, I, I'm not a physicist, but I think God just made the photons quit. And so there it was. When Jesus was crucified, he made it dark. Yeah. Noon to three o'clock. That was not an eclipse because the Passover happens the first full moon after the spring equinox, you cannot have a solar eclipse during a full moon because True. the moon's back here. Right. And plus it doesn't last three hours. So both of those times that God was judging, God was judging Egypt, God was judging Jesus, He made the earth go dark, to me implies that the darkness in Genesis 1-2 was a period of judgment. It wasn't because the sun wasn't there, He just made it go dark. You know, Day one, he said, "Okay, now let there be light." Now, having talked with Steve, uh, I I know about him that he is very, very involved in uh, the gospel. That's why we're here at Prophecy Absolutely. Watchers. We teach Bible prophecy to show people the literalness of the Bible, and uh, and I believe, Steve, that if you can demonstrate the veracity of Scripture people will come to Christ. You, yeah. you don't have to go out there and lead them through the gospel. They'll be hungry to receive it if you can show them that it's real. And I think your book is aimed at that. Uh, there's a certain reality to what we see when we uh, look at, at the creation. Uh, in the Bible, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void. The way the Bible starts it, it speaks very matter-of-factly about the creation. And then it goes on to speak of days and nights Mm -hmm. and the creation of Adam and Eve. And uh, you either believe that or you don't. And some people might say, well, you know, that just sounds like kind of old school superstition to me. I can't really believe in there was a literal Adam and Eve and on and on and on. But systematically, it's the only thing that works. (laughs) That is the, the biblical explanation is the closest thing to reality that we have. Yeah. Well, Again, without form and void in, in Genesis 1 2, what does that mean? Gosh, that's, that's talk about it all day. Yeah. In the beginning, what does that mean? Exactly. There, there are so many different theories of creation. 
that some will say, well, at the beginning, is, that's symbolic. Creation is symbolic. My problem is that I want to destroy all these barriers. Because there are some theories that this is what the Bible says, they'll say, that wind up being opposed to what science reveals. And that may be okay for some people because they want to reject science anyway. But for the most part, when people read something that disagrees with what science reveals, truly reveals, they're going to say, well, the Bible's got it wrong about our origin. Okay, God made a mistake. God's lying. God didn't know. And if he doesn't get the origin right, if we can't trust that, how can we trust him with what it says about our destiny? And so what I've done in this book is I want people to realize that true science, what science truly reveals, and what true Bible, what the Bible truly reveals, not interpretations, are in perfect agreement. There's nothing in all my... I've been a practitioner for 30 years, science, eight years of college. Nothing I've ever seen in science, true science, ever contradicts anything truly revealed in the Bible, and vice versa. I've never seen anything in the Bible that contradicts, there's apparent contradictions, anything truly revealed by science. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want, especially unbelievers, to know. They can trust what the Bible said about our origin. And and by the way, what the Bible says agrees with what we see with our own eyes. If I look out there and uh, I I go down and I purchase a uh, a telescope and maybe maybe I buy a good one. I want to spend $4,000 and get one of those really good, you know, 14 inches or something in my backyard and I go out and look at, at galaxies and Wow, you know, the books say that one is uh, 10 million light years away, which means the whole creation must be 10 million years old. Can I actually believe that, or is that just an illusion? And I know what I believe, and and I, I think that your belief is the same. You want to uh, read Scripture in such a way that it's in absolute concordance with with what you see in creation. Yeah. Well, Again, there are some theories of creation that will say, well, that's just a parent age. God made it look as if that star is that far away. Those are just apparent. You know, the, the star was there, created day four, whatever, so the light couldn't have gotten here. It would take millions of years. So God made it appear as if the star was there. My problem with that is, if you look at the six days, if that was apparent, that wasn't really what was there, what else was apparent? When he made birds, were they apparent or were they real? When he made Adam, was he real or apparent? What other things? Okay, the stars weren't really there, only apparent stars. Were, you know, were fish really there? Grass, trees, fruit trees, were they real or apparent? Everything in the Genesis 6 days were real, literal creations. They weren't just apparent trees, they were real trees. So my interpretation is those are real stars not just photons of light coming in midstream. So, and they were not created in an illusory fashion? No, no, no. no. That would make God deceptive. If, if God made it look like they were there when they really weren't, to me, that's, then, then I really can't trust God. So I think the first chapter of Genesis talks about a real, what you're seeing is what He had really made. Only it's a restoration of what had been there before, and now he's taking the dark that he'd created and let, he didn't destroy the universe, he just made it go dark, at least on earth, and now he's letting that be seen again. And that, that just makes perfect sense to me. And you know, when I think of creation, I think of John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God, and we learned that the Word took on human flesh, dwelt among us, and He became our Redeemer. And, and this is the creative force that created the heavens and the earth in the beginning. The vastness of all this just takes my breath away when I really put it all together and think, this is not an illusion, this is not uh, something that is compacted together in a few thousand years, this is the, the galaxies, the universe, the, 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 uh, the gigantic reality of it all, and, and in the middle of it is my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who created all this. <laughs> Again, it just takes my breath away. 
to think about these things. And yet when I read, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, it's a, it's a narrative. It's just talking about something that happened. That's a historic event, or events. It, it really happened in time and space. Some people think that's just symbolic of something, that yeah, really, yeah. But, but no, that really happened. So when did it happen? Right. And, and there's a problem with that. You either have to take Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2 as part of the first day, because it's not a summary of the creation week, because they end, with Genesis 1, 2 ends with death and darkness. There's nothing there, it's all dead. Genesis 6 doesn't end that way. So that's not a summary. Some people say that, but the summary doesn't agree. So is it part of the first day, or did it come before the first day? Mm. And if you look at the pattern in Genesis, there's, and God said let, that marks the beginning of each day. And the evening, the morning, or the whatever day, that marks the end. Mm-hmm. For those six days, that pattern sets up. But Genesis 1-1 doesn't have that. Genesis 1-2 doesn't end that way. Which implies, in the Hebrew, this is what the ancient Hebrews believed, that that was a period of time before the six days. Now, it doesn't say how long before, but Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2 were not part of day one. They came before day one. Now, so and, how long? and something caused this destruction. Yeah. That is, there, there is a discernible series of events. But before we go into that, uh, I want to go back, because you mentioned uh, the ancient Hebrew beliefs in, in, in what you have written in your book. But you, there are also a lot of scholars um, in the last two, three hundred years who have believed and taught mm-hmm. this. And, and let's talk about who they are and what they believe. And you mentioned uh, them in your book, In the Beginnings. Well, uh, uh, one misconception is the idea that what I call the gap theory, there's different names for it, ruin restoration, restoration theory. Uh, there's a term I've made called duogenesis, mm. which I kind of like but it's not out there. But the idea is there was an original creation of the heavens and the earth, how long that was, a judgment, a destruction, Mm -hmm. and then a restoration. Now, that's not something that was created 20 years ago, 30 years years ago. That was believed long ago. During the 1800s, the, the late 1700s to 1800s, that was, and I've got quotes, people saying this, that was the most prominent interpretation of Genesis. And, and so that's, in fact, so much so that just what they all believe. Spurgeon believed it. He gave a sermon on how the earth was destroyed and restored. Mm. Okay? So it wasn't, it's not a new theory. It's not something brand new. In fact, it's older than what's believed today in a lot of, a lot of ways. Um, so it wasn't new. This is not something I created with, came up with. It's not something that uh, Jack created. We're just going back to 100 years ago, before that. Here's what the scholars believed then, mm-hmm. and here's why they believed it. And so there's a whole long list of scholars. In, in, uh, if you go to uh, uh, the book Without Foreign and Void by Arthur Custance, he lists about 80 s- scholars who believe this. And one of the things that, uh, for example, when we have Jack Langford here, and, and he's written a book on the same subject, uh, uh, he really goes into detail about how, how Hebrew teaching uh, yeah. is, is based upon this idea. Um, Isaiah 14, uh, Jeremiah chapter 4, two prophets who used the terms without form and void. Yeah in their prophecies. Same identical term you Same find words. in Genesis 1-2. Uh, yeah. And <clears throat> we discover that those terms really mean what they say, without form and void. Absolute chaotic destruction. And not just destruction, but judgment. See, when I say Genesis 1-2, the earth was without form and void, and darkness on the face of the deep, I'm describing a period that God had judged the earth for sin. Something happened and God judged it. There are people who, oh no, that's not true. It just means kind of unfilled, unformed, not created yet. Yeah. But if you look at Isaiah 4, and I mean Isaiah 34 and Jeremiah 4, you will see that they use those same two words in reference to God's judgment. 
And those are the only place in the Bible they are used. Isaiah is talking about judgment on Edom. He uses those words. Tohu and Bohu. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah judging Israel. Tohu, Bohu. So we got two places in the Bible where God uses those words in reference to judgment. No place else are they used. So if they mean judgment in Isaiah and in Jeremiah, why can't they mean judgment in Genesis 1? I think they do. And then the next question is, why was uh, this judgment brought down upon planet Earth? Well, it wasn't because of Adam. He wasn't there yet. He wasn't there yet. Okay. So in order for him being judged... And by the way, let me just interrupt you sure. right at, at that point and say original sin didn't originate with Adam and Eve. No. No. In, in fact, there's a, diff- well, there's a difference between being the first sin on earth and the first sin in the world. The Bible talks about by one man sin entered into the world. That's a different word than earth. Yes. And that's a different point. Okay, that's important. Satan committed the first sin on earth. We, we know in, in the Bible, the first sin was when he questioned Eve. Surely, yeah, he, he's trying to get Eve to sin. When you try to coax someone into sinning, you're sinning. So he asked Eve a question designed to make her doubt God. Right. And then he says, you know, sh- the second sin was, surely you won't die. No. He's lying to her. Yes. Okay. Now this is before Adam sinned, but he's in, he's in Eden. So had sin been introduced to the earth? Well, yeah, it's already there. Okay, the third sin, we said, no, it's good for you. You'll, you'll be like God. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's the third sin. The fourth sin was Eve took the fruit and ate it. Now that's a sin. She rebelled against God. At that point, was there sin on earth? Yeah, Eve just sinned. There wasn't sin in the world yet. Okay, the fifth sin was when Eve took the fruit and offered it to Adam. When you offer somebody to make them sin, you're sinning. The fifth sin. Now the sixth sin was when Adam ate it. Adam committed the sixth sin on the planet Earth. Mm. Which I find fascinating because the word the the number six is often associated with man and with sin. Absolutely. And that may be why. So Adam committed the sixth sin on Earth, but the first sin in the world. Because the world used is the word cosmos. And that's different, different than geos, meaning Earth. And so looking backward, which we do in the Bible, uh, we look back to causality and we find uh, this formlessness, this chaos that had to be remedied. And the formlessness and chaos was brought about by an enemy of the Creator. And and elsewhere in the Bible we read about him. Yeah, You you can't have judgment unless there's somebody who sinned and did something wrong. If the earth was the earth inanimate object he wouldn't judge it. Yeah. So that means that implies there was some sort of intelligent being or beings or civilization that sin rebelled against God that needed to be judged. And the result of that judgment was the destruction of the earth. And Jeremiah talks about that. And so it's a very natural thing for that to have come down into Hebrew teaching. Yes, yes. Uh, they were very wise, mm-hmm. the, the priests of God. And, and in many ways, before their great sins, that they were closer to God than anybody else on earth, and and they would have been given to understand the history of judgment on this planet, absolutely, and the, the need for redemption. Yes, and well, uh, and and so they it became a part of their teaching. An important, very important point that many Christians forget is that how the Hebrews interpreted the Hebrew. See, the Bible is written in Hebrew. I say it's yeah. written by Hebrew, in Hebrew, for Hebrews. So if you don't know the Hebrew language and culture, which I don't, it's hard for us to say this is what the Bible means. While they did not have the scientific knowledge we have, they had something we don't. They had perfect knowledge of the Hebrew language and culture. We've got professors in seminaries and argue about what this Hebrew word means mm-hmm. and what that Hebrew word means and this Hebrew phrase, they wouldn't have argued. They'd know this is what it means. So how the ancient Hebrews interpreted Genesis ought to be a factor in how we interpret it. And when you look at the ancient Hebrew, that's something Jack brings out in his book. The most ancient interpretation is that there was a period of time before the first day. And it was without form and void. Now how long was that? I don't know. 
but it existed before that first day. And if it was tohu vabohu, without form and void, that's describing judgment. And there's a judgment in Jeremiah uh, chapter 4. I just opened my Bible here to Jeremiah 4.23 where Jeremiah says, I beheld the earth and lo it was without form and void in the heavens. Uh, they had and they had no light. And so <clears throat> Jeremiah is using this as an illustration. Mm -hmm. That is to say he, he is given a vision of a, 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 the complete destruction chaotic jumble of nothingness as an illustration of God's judgment. And he's speaking to his people Israel when he does this. Yes, he's warning them about judgment. Now, would they have known what he was talking about? Yeah. Why warn them with something they didn't know anything about? <laughs> okay, Obviously they did. When he said without form and void, tohu vabohu, the first place that was mentioned in the Bible was Genesis. That made an instant connection. They, there's no way the Hebrew, could, Hebrew people could hear the words without form of void and dark and not think of Genesis 1-1. So Jeremiah is warning them with a judgment, a similar situation to what God had done before. Mm -hmm. He's telling them, if you don't repent, get back to me, I'm going to destroy you the same way. Except later on he says, but I will not bring you Totally. I will not totally destroy you. A full end. So my question is, when did God make the earth without form and void and dark, because he said there's no light, mm -hmm. and dead? What period of time? It, is, is, that, is that a picture of the end times? Is When God comes back to the earth, when Jesus returns, is he going to kill everybody and destroy all the cities, make the earth a desolate waste? It's not what the Bible says. It's going to be a restoration. So if Jeremiah sees the earth dead, desolate, dark, judged, it had to be... And no man was and, alive. And no man was alive. There was no man. So when was there earth with no man? That was before Adam. So he couldn't have been looking into the future. No, he was looking at the past. He was looking into the past. Yeah, and I think the ancient Hebrews would have instantly recognized that. And what he's doing is he's telling them, if you look at Jeremiah, he's going down this list. If you don't do this, I will do this. I will do that to you. I will do this. But at Jeremiah 4.23 he suddenly shifts tense. And the Hebrew has a different way of doing tense. Hmm. It's now it's no longer what I will do in the past. Look what was, I mean in the future, look what was in the past. This is what was. And he just like, I, I, I beheld and it was. I beheld and it was. There's a list of was. And then he goes back, that's a parenthesis. He's taking a parenthesis, warning them about a past judgment. And then he goes on saying, I, I will do this. So he stops in his warning to Israel. He says, now let me tell you what God's going to do. He's going to do to you what he did to the earth in the past. He's mm -hmm. going to make you dead, desolate, ruined, dark, no man. He's going to destroy Israel, but he won't make a full end. So Jeremiah's looking at the past, not the future. He's not looking at any time since Adam. He's looking at a definable past. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> they but, would have known what he was talking but about. But when was that then? When, when did God make the earth dark, desolate? Only one time Only one we time, know Genesis 1-2. Yeah. Now here we have then, uh, if you will, a prophetic rendering of Scripture. Because prophecy does not look uh, just forward. Right. It looks backward along the timeline. Isaiah 46 I created, God said I created the end from the beginning. Absolutely. And, and wow, how does that work? And yet, and yet prophecy takes, it takes in the entire timeline. And it, it does so for a reason because God has a plan which He reveals to those who follow Him through Christ. And that's what we're doing here. Uh, I think our reasoning in having this discussion today, if you happen to be watching and you have not received Christ as your Savior, there is every reason to do so because the Bible declares actuality, the things that have really, really happened. You can believe it. The, the whole idea of ruin restoration, of the earth experiencing a destruction and a restoration is a foreshadow, an image of man's history. We experience sin, death, destruction, and only as Christians do we experience restoration. 
God restores us. God restored the earth. Paul says God shines light, it's spiritual light, into our hearts. But he said it's the same as when God shined the physical light into the earth. Both of those things are God has to do that. The earth couldn't receive light, couldn't make its own light. We can't make our own spiritual light. God makes light. God restores life. It happened to the earth, happens to us. Well, I wish we had more time. Is <laughs> this, I, we're just getting to the good part and we have to quit. <laughs> Steve, There's thanks so for being with say, us. So much more I'd ask you. I've got questions from you. <laughs> well, you, you know, all I can say is keep writing because uh, the, the work you're doing is good and we appreciate it. I thank you again for being here.